Lord, if you would, Ephesians chapter 6. Sound people, if, if you can just give me as much as you can give me without blowing a speaker or making a ringing noise, I would appreciate that tonight. Thank you, my brother. All right. Ephesians chapter 6. We're living in a, in a terrible world. We really are. I don't, I don't read much news or listen to much news. I, I just, I quit doing that a long time ago. It just got so depressing. But every now and then I hear things and my wife will tell me some things and it just disturbs my spirit, the kind of world that we live in. And the enemy is fighting us greater now than he ever has before because he knows the time is short. The time is short. And you and I tonight have got to make up our mind whether we're going to live for God or not. And, I, you know, I know this is the first night of revival, and, and, but I, I just feel impressed in my spirit. I was on the way out here. It took us two days to get out here because we just finished up revival with Brother Kite on, uh, this morning. So it took us two days to one eight and a half, the other nine-hour drive. And uh, on the way out here, the Lord began to deal with me about something. And so I wrote this message on the way out here. And, uh, and I want to preach it to you because I feel like tonight that we, we need it. So look at this with me at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And having done all, to stand. Have you ever felt like sometimes that you've done everything you can do and you don't know what else to do? Yeah. The Bible said when you reach that point, Paul said, just stand. Just stand. There comes a point that God tells all of us, I don't want you to fight anymore. All I want you to do is stand. Stand on what you know is true. Stand on what you know is right. Stand up for what you believe in and watch God win the battle for you tonight. Hallelujah. Friend, God's on our side tonight. How many know God's on our side? Let's love him together tonight. Jesus, we love you. We praise you for the power of your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us here tonight, God, for answering the cry of your people, Lord, who called out to you tonight to come here, to meet us in this place tonight, to inhabit our praises, Lord. We thank you tonight for gracing us with your presence. Oh, God, tonight we thank you for accepting the invitation. Now, Lord, I want you to be God when you're here tonight. I don't want you to be anything else but who you are. Lord, break every chain in this house tonight. Deliver us tonight, God. Heal us. Make us new tonight, God. Give us the grace that we need, God, to stand our ground in these times we live in tonight. Help us tonight. In Jesus' name, we praise you and give you glory. Would you clap your hands to the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. You may be seated. The Lord bless you tonight. In June of 1967, the United Nations passed Resolution 242, which stated that if there were to be peace in the Middle East, that Israel was supposed to return to pre-1967 borders. And that... In a nutshell, the Palestinians were supposed to recognize Israel's right to exist as a nation. But here we are in 2015, and we're still having that debate. We're still dealing with a crisis in the Middle East, and we're still dealing with the back and forth bickering of who's right and who's wrong. And one of the problems of this resolution and trying to get this passed, and every president since then has tried his best to create this kind of a ideal situation in the Middle East, is a problem because the nature of the enemy is not peace but annihilation. Yeah. Israel understands that if they are to return to pre-1967 borders, doing so will compromise their safety and lead to their demise. Now, I want you to understand that same spirit of compromise is battling against spiritual Israel, the church. 
That same spirit of compromise, if we'll just compromise, then we'll have peace and everything will be all right. But I'm telling you, compromise will be the death of us. It will. There are two sides to every issue. There is a right and there is a wrong. And I can respect somebody if they're wrong. But in the middle is an evil and a very dangerous place to be in. Jesus said, I would either have you hot or cold and not lukewarm. Even God understands and respects the right of when you and I are wrong. He said, I'd rather have you cold or rather have you on fire. Because the enemy understands how powerless he is against the power of the truth. The things that we believe in and the way that we live our lives has the power to tear down the enemy's kingdom. Come on. To compromise would be detrimental. But standing up for what you believe in has the power to deliver you from every vice of the enemy. How many still believe the truth shall make you free tonight? Oh, I said the truth will make you free. The enemy fears stability. The Bible talks about in the book of James about a double-minded man will receive nothing of the Lord. The enemy understands and fears stability, but being double-minded creates instability. When you find people in church who are double-minded, you understand that they lack the conviction in their beliefs to hold to what they say they believe in. They are quick to change their loyalties. They change their mind depending on who they're with and where they are at. And I'll tell you one thing, we, we go through sometimes these moments in our life where some people around us, if they really question what we believe in, you'll find yourself being called narrow-minded. But I'd rather be called narrow-minded than to be called double-minded. Yeah. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not narrow-minded. I just walk down a narrow pathway. The Bible said, Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Is anybody on that narrow way tonight? Has anybody made your mind up? I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded. Is anybody persuaded and your mind is made up? God can keep you on this road you travel. Oh, how did I say God will keep you? He said, I'm persuaded he is able to keep me. Let me tell you, when you walk this world tonight, if you believe and you hold on to what you believe in, you've got a God you know has the power to keep you. Does anybody know he's keeping you? He's keeping me. See, oppression will try to forcibly change your allegiance to the truth. Every one of us are dealing with pressures and fears and worries that try their best to overshadow us. But the moment you make up your mind to stand your ground against the wiles of the devil, it is evidence of God's enduring power. When you say to yourself, I feel the pressure and I feel the fight and I feel the enemy wearing at my mind, but I've got it made up to the point that whatever I've got to suffer, I'm going to hold on to what I believe in. Let me tell you, that is endurance. And endurance is grace under pressure. The Bible tells us we have grace to help us in the time of our need. And when you're looking at your life and you know the problem you're dealing with but you're still making it, you can look and say, thank you, God, for endurance. And endurance is your grace under pressure. Anybody under pressure tonight? But just stand in your crown and say no to the devil and tell the devil, I shall not be moved. Has anybody got your mind made up? Oh, I've got my foot on the rock and my mind is made up. Anybody got your mind made up? If I gotta go through hell, I'll go through hell. But I got my mind made up. I will not quit and I will not back down. Come on, somebody. Come on with it. In this day and age we live in, we are not going to compromise. The truth is still the truth. Whether you quit or I quit, the truth is still the truth. And I've got to hold on to it. God gives us a place to stand. 
Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, whoever hears my word and obeys my word or does my word, he said he will be like a house that is built upon the rock and the floods came and beat against it and they vehemently beat against it with the wind. The Bible said the house was not torn down. So what is Jesus telling us? He's telling us that obedience to his word places us in a stable place. Let me tell you something. If you obey the word of God, Jesus said, I will make your feet stable. Jesus said, if you obey my word, I will plant you on a rock and nothing has the power to move you. I'm standing on a promise from God tonight that if I obey his word, I may feel the violent effects of the wind. I may feel the violent effects of the wind and the rain and the beating that I've been taking. That I've got a promise from my God that I will not fall. Is anybody being beat in this building tonight? Is anybody feeling the effects of the devil fighting you? But look at how you're standing. You still got your shout. You still got your praise. Why? Because Jesus said, you will not fall if you obey my word. God, if I obey his word, I'm gonna come out of this the winner. Hallelujah. Paul said, Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying the bonds and afflictions about me. He said, But none of these things move me. Anybody understand? Anybody the same mind Paul is tonight? I understand I've got a tough road ahead of me. I've got afflictions and I've got a devil to fight. But none of these things move me. Nothing's going to change my mind. Nothing's going to make me clear. I'm standing on the way. And I'm not going to change. Shut up, Rabbi Bohusha. Sister Magruder sung a song that because of the times called Stand on His Word. Carol Magruder told the story before she sung the song. One morning coming down the hall, and you know how Sister Magruder had dealt with cancer and died of cancer, but. One morning, Carol Magruder comes down the hall of the house and looks into the prayer room in their house, and there stands Sister Magruder standing on top of the Bible. He looked at her and he said, Honey, what are you doing? She looked at him and didn't barely have even the strength to talk to him. But she let him know. She said, I don't have the strength even to pray. She said, So I'm just standing on the word. Anybody in the house standing on his word tonight? I said, I'm standing on his word. I'm trusting in what his word said. That if I obey this word, the devil can beat me all day long, but he can't make me fall. If I will shut up or run down on my high, if I'm standing on the word, no devil in hell can move me. How many of you are standing on his word? You understand our privilege is permanent. Our privilege is permanent. Why? Because grace never changes. I'm standing by the grace of God. Has God the Bible said God is able to make you stand? You have the privilege and the power of God's promise that God said I will hold you up. Anybody in the building feel like standing on the promises of God? Woo! My God, I'm standing on a promise. This life we live is a battle. And the truth of it is this battle has sides. Whose side are you on? Moses asked the same question in his day and time. He said, who is on the Lord's side? Because Moses knew that people have a tendency to straddle the fence. Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of Pentecostals who look the part and act the part. But when the time of testing comes, testing always reveals what's in your heart. When the beatings come, it always reveals what's in your heart. When the storm blows, it reveals what's in your heart. 
And this battle that you and I are in tonight, it has to be fought every minute of every day. It is a life and a death struggle with no time for you and I to let down our guard. Simon Peter said, be sober and be vigilant. Simon Peter said, don't go asleep and don't let down your guard. Because we have an adversary that goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. This battle we're in tonight is hard. And to be honest with you, it is intensified. The Lord told Jeremiah, he said, the footman, he said, I've wearied thee. He said, what are you going to do when it comes to the horses? And I'm telling you something tonight. We are no longer running with the footmen. We're running with the horses. He said, if the land you're in now is peaceful, he said, what are you going to do when Jordan swells its banks? And let me tell you, Jordan is swelling its banks so that things are getting out of control. And we are living in perilous times. And these signs of the times that Jesus talked about, they're ominous and they're pretentious, they're dire and they're threatening. But it doesn't mean that you and I are supposed to bury our head in the sand. Jesus said just the opposite. He said when you see these signs appearing, look up. Now, I don't know about you tonight, but I understand how the darkness can be deceiving because it limits our vision. But our faith is not in what we can see. Our faith is in what we know. We know the end. We know the end of the story. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Is anybody hanging on to the word of God that your redemption is on its way? My God, my God, I said my redemption's on its way. It's time to look up. I know the battle's hard against you, but look up. I know people don't understand you, but look up. Look up. We know darkness is inferior to the light. Hallelujah. See, C.S. Lewis said, what you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you're standing. Where are we standing tonight, in fear? Or are we standing in faith? See, darkness masquerades itself as permanent, but it's not. It's limited in, in its duration. Because the Bible said that we put men dirt for the night, but what joy cometh in the morning? There is an end to this thing. There is a limit to what the devil can do in your life. Come on. There is a limit to how long this battle can last. There's a limit. Darkness may be strong around you, but the Bible said when the light comes, victory comes as well. And I'm telling you, the sun's coming up, church. The sun is coming up. You may not be able to see far ahead of you right now, but you can understand if I can stand long enough, I'm going to see the sunlight coming through the cloud. If I can hold on long enough, I will see my way out of this thing. Anybody been shaking lately? The Bible said in Hebrews 12, 27, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And he's talking about created things, everything that is created. 9-11 was a shaking. That's right. Yeah, 9-11 was a shaking. This country was shook. You know, people were running back to church. It was amazing. It really was to see. I mean, it's sad for all those people who lost their lives, but it's, it's amazing how it really just got people to thinking but as most things go we are quick to forget them but the Bible said in Hebrews 12 27 that there would come another shaking and that the Lord would shake heaven and earth it wouldn't just be the earth being shaken it'd be heaven itself being shaken so he said the things that can be shaken will be shaken things that are created will be shaken but the things that are recreated cannot be shaken if you tonight are a child of God when the shaking happens you won't be affected by it your neighbor may wonder what the world is wrong but you're not going to be affected by it because he said we're going to shake those things he says so those things that cannot be shaken will remain and he goes on to say, for we have received a kingdom that cannot be moved. If you're in the kingdom, the Bible said you will survive the shaking. 
You may feel the effect of it, but the effect of it won't destroy you if you're in the kingdom. You will survive the shaking if you're standing on the unmovable rock of ages. And I tell you what, it's overwhelming. And the effect of it is we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about the last days. We don't want to talk about the end of time. We don't want to talk about the rapture. We don't want to talk about hell. We don't want to really talk about heaven. Because when we start talking about heaven, we just think about people who die. And I'll be honest, we get to talking about the rapture. We get talking about the last days and the Antichrist and all this stuff. Going on. People's going, oh, I don't want to hear all that. I don't hear all that. I just want to enjoy it right now. Well, have fun because let me tell you something. It's going to happen. Now, I'm not a prophecy teacher and I never claimed to be one. I don't know if we're going to be here. We're going to be gone. You hear one guy preach it, we're going to be here. You hear somebody else preach it, we're not going to be here. You hear somebody else preach it, we're going up in the middle of it. I just my 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 theology is this: I'm just going to be ready. <clears throat> this right here is dress rehearsal. I thank you, Pastor. I said this is dress rehearsal, and I'm getting ready. How about you? But it's overwhelming. It really is. When you begin to think about everything in your life, if you were to sit here tonight and think about all the problems you've got, some of you would be so messed up for you left here. I was happy to start talking about that, but the problem now, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do. Around where we live in Tennessee, that people are nosy. People are nosy around here. There, there are people that have come up in my yard that I've never seen in my life and they know too much about what goes on in my yard. That's how noise, nosy they are. They drive by the house and, and they're like this. They're just and if you wave at them, they go, I caught you. And they know about stuff. And I've had people come up in my yard and say, hey man, I noticed you got so-and-so wrong with the house. I'm like, really? One guy come up in the yard and he said, knock the door. He goes, man, he said, I see you need a lot of help around here. I said, I do? <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, if you need some help, he said, just give me a call. And I'm like, I didn't know I need any help. Then I get to looking around the house. I'm like, well, you know, that could probably use some work. Well, you may be right about that right there, man. Before you know, you just overwhelm yourself. Like, my God, the house is falling apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the way it is, if we start talking about all the stuff we got going on, some of you holding your head in your hands, going, oh, God, oh, God. Yeah, can't make it. But you know what David said? He said, well, my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. David said, when my heart gets unsteady, when I begin to waver under the pressure of everything going on in my life, he said, lead me to a place. He said, lead me to the rock. He said, that's higher than I. He said, well, I've got too many things to deal with, and I don't know how to deal with it. That's some of us tonight. We're overwhelmed with everything we've got to deal with, and we don't really know how to deal with any of it. But he said, God, bring me to a place where you can give me the strength to steady me again. Some of us need to be steadied again. We're running this way, we're running that way. We can't make a mind up around anything. We need God to bring us to a place of refuge where we can lay it all down at his feet and say, God, give me the strength to steady me. Steady me. Say, sometimes we get overwhelmed with trying to fight stuff that's not ours to fight. Jehoshaphat said to the Lord after three armies came against Jerusalem, he said, we have no might, he said, against this great company that cometh up against us. He said, neither know we what to do. That is a tough place to get in when you look around and say, I don't have an answer. But he made a very important statement in the next sentence. He said, but our eyes are upon you. He said, God, we don't know what to do. He said, I'm not here to focus 
focus on the battle. I'm here to focus on the God that has the battle in his hands. Friend, but we live in the day and age that we live in. You cannot get your eyes on the problem you got around you. Get it on the problem solver. He said, and God responded. And he said, the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Is anybody getting ready for God to bring you out of this thing you're going through? My God, the only thing God is looking for out of you is a worshiper. Do you understand God is fighting your battle? So you know what God wants you to do? Cheer him on. Come on. Worship will never lose its place in the church. Why? Because we got a God that is fighting the battle for you. So let God hear the shout of your appreciation. Let God have a standing ovation and let him know the battle is yours, Lord. The battle is in your hands. Somebody praise him and give him glory as he fights your battle. Look at somebody and tell him God's working this out. Look at somebody else and tell them, God, is working this out. So God, teach me how to stand still. Teach me how to relax. Teach me how to let go of what I can't fix. Teach me how to drop it in your hands. Thank you, Pastor. Look at somebody and tell them, relax. That's what stand still translates to mean. Relax. What is God trying to tell us tonight? He's telling us to relax. God said, I've got it under control. God said, I've got this thing in my hands tonight. This battle, I know it's against you, but don't worry about fighting it. I've got it under control. So go ahead and relax. Woo! Stop panicking. Uh, let me tell you something. If you want your pastor to live a long life, relax. Yeah. If you don't want your pastor mad at you, relax. Oh, he ain't mad at you. Well, I don't know. He might be. I don't know. I love him. Yeah, I know you do. Oh, I'm excited to see what God's done in this church. Amen. So stop panicking. Relax. Drop it. If she don't like you, let it go. If your boss don't like you, let it go. Relax. Panicking gives the enemy permission to come in and rob our harvest because when we panic, we run. The Bible said that the Philistines would come every year at a certain time of the year and steal the harvest away from the Israelites. But the Bible said there was a man in Shammah who stood in that lentil patch and fought against the enemy. There are things that come in our life that come in cycles. You know, you can look back in families. I've prayed for people before and I've seen the way God shows me is interesting, but I, I see how things are in generations. I prayed for a lady here a while back. I said, well, you've got so-and-so wrong with you. And I said, your mama had it and your grandma had it and somebody else in your family's got it. She said, well, that's right, they do. And I said, it's just a cycle. I said, it passes from one to the other. Here it goes. And there's a lot of things in our life that are, that are like that. It just comes around. It just, same old patterns, same old habits, same old things. And, and the enemy is so good at, at, coming, at finding out and learning our habits and things that we do because a certain time of the year, here they come. You can count on it. You can bank on it. Every time you do this right here, the devil's going to fight you. Every time you make up your mind to do something here, the devil's going to come and try to discourage you. 
It's every time. And here stood Shama in that lentil patch, looking at everyone else around him running. And the Bible said he stood. See, the fact of it is he had a reason to stand. Revival is a reason to stand. Your neighbor that's lost without God is a reason for you to stand your ground. Why would we go to the effort of putting all that time and effort and energy into planting a field just to get scared and run every time the enemy shows his head? I have put too much time and too much effort into my ministry to allow a devil to make me quit. Have I been fought? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I have been fought. And I have been through hell in 2014. But let me tell you, there's a God here tonight. The moment you make up your mind, I'm not going to run this time. Let me tell you, there'll be a God that'll stand by your side. Where are the shamans in the Pentecostal church? Where are the men and the women who will take a stand for revival and say, devil, you're not going to run me out of this church. You're not going to make me quit. I've got too much invested in this to quit now. I've got a revival. I've got a harvest on the way. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Listen to what Paul says. <coughs> Paul said, Epaphras, whatever his name is, E-P-A-P-R-H-R-A-S. Maybe some of you folks can pronounce it. I can. Epaphras. That's close enough. <laughs> Who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. He said, this guy's one of you. He's talking to the Colossian church. He said, this guy, Ephesus, is one of you. He said, he salutes you, and he's always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. When you translate the words laboring fervently, you get two words, fighting and wrestling. How was he fighting in prayer? Paul said, you've got one of your own. He said that is fighting in prayer and wrestling in prayer for you always. For what? That you may stand complete and perfect in all of the will of God. I want you to understand this man was an intercessor. Somebody was interceding for the people of Colossians and he was praying for them that they would stand perfect in the will of God. Friend, where are the intercessors in 2015? There's somebody in this church that is having trouble standing up and we need people today that will fight and wrestle in the spirit so that you and I can stand complete in all of the will of God. Where are the intercessors? I want to know, can I count on you? when I can't stand up on my own. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, intercessors are a dying breed in Pentecost. When I was a child, you would hear women all over the church weeping and wailing in tongues, groaning in the spirit, and you don't hear that much anymore. I prayed for a young lady a few weeks ago and I called her out. I said, the spirit of an intercessor is on your life. She fell on the floor and began to weep and wail. There was a woman standing right behind her. I said, sister, you got the same spirit. And she started crying. She said, Bella Palmer, years ago, she said, I would pray and speak in tongues for hours. I would intercede for hours. She said, I've lost it and I want to get it back again. Why? Because we need it in this time we live in. Somebody that is fighting and wrestling for you and me to stand. Standing means sometimes you got to stand alone. Hmm. 
People will stand with you as long as it benefits them. And people will quit the moment they think you're going to lose. <laughs> and the sad thing is we were never meant to stand alone. We were created with a need for fellowship. God created Adam and Eve and he came down in the cool of the day and he fellowshiped with them. We were created for a need, with a need for fellowship. Because walking alone through adverse situations is a very dark road to travel. No matter who we are, feelings have a way sometimes of just taking over. And loneliness is smothering. You ever been lonely before? Hmm. It's smothering. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, which some scholars believe that it was Paul's last book that he wrote before he died, he wrote to Timothy and he said, All men forsook me. Hmm. All men. Paul had a lot of people around him. But he looked at, he said to Timothy he, in his letter, he said, Everybody's left me. Paul said, Nobody come to my defense. Demas is over here. Titus is over here. This one's over here. He said, There's nobody here. Everybody has forsook me. And Paul was standing before a very, very wicked man, a man named Nero. The emperor of Rome. Nero was a madman. He was a he was crazy, just to put it mildly. Yeah. He would take he burned down Rome so he could build his golden palace and he hadn't had an excuse to do it, so he blamed the Christians for it. And he took Christians and wrapped them up in animal skins and dipped them in oil and tar and used them to light the streets of Rome, which he would race up and down in at nighttime in his chariot. His aunt looked at him when he was just a young man, when he still didn't have whiskers on his face, and she said, I hope I live long enough, she said, to see you shave. And he said, oh, you will. And he took out a knife and began to scrape on his face, then took the same knife and cut her throat. A madman. I could go on and on with stories about Nero and talk about things that he'd done. And Paul was not standing before somebody with a kind heart. Paul was standing before somebody that was demon-possessed, out of his mind. And Paul looks and Paul says, everybody's forsook me. But then he says these words, notwithstanding, or regardless, or despite it all, he said, the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. Friend, when we realize tonight who's backing us up, we'll stop backing up. We're facing... A madman tonight. We're facing an adversary that hates you and hates everything you stand up for and believe in. And if he can have his way with you, he would destroy your life and leave you with nothing. But the problem is tonight, he can't do it because somebody's standing beside me. Paul said on one occasion, the angel of the Lord stood with me this night. See, the fact of it is, God believes in you. God would not have called you if he didn't believe in you. So, what does he mean by that? It means simply this. He will not abandon you. If God believes in me, he's not going to abandon me now. But the Bible said he'll strengthen you. So Paul said, and having done all, stand. Paul should realize, he said, there's going to be moments in your life where people will walk away from you. People will be there to a certain point and then they'll leave. And they'll walk away and leave you standing there by yourself. Paul said, but understand one thing. He said, every man forsook me, but the Lord stood with me. It means God helped me. That God was standing there with the purpose to help me. Let me tell you, God's not here tonight to judge you. He's here to help you. Standing beside you to help you. So the Bible said, and having done all, stand. See, having done all, it's not always a statement of desperation. No. Having done all, it's not always a statement of despair. Paul said this, he said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that, that's a powerful statement because Paul said, listen, he said, 
Stand still knowing, he said, that your labor is not in vain. Anybody here tonight wore out from laboring? It happens to us. Going to church sometimes will wear you out. Facing the fight every day will wear you out. But Paul said, understand, he said, everything that you're doing, he said, is not in vain in the Lord. And how many times the devil's told us, well, it's not working. But God said, it's not in vain. Many times said, well, is it doing any good? But God said, it's not in vain. And every one of us had felt those moments and then we thought, well, why should I keep doing this? Because it's not doing any good. But Paul said, stand fast knowing. He said, and be unmovable knowing. He said, that your work in the Lord is not in vain. See, something happens when your prayer time turns into praise time. Prayers that are prayed in faith often turn into praise. So the question is, is there ever time to quit praying? Maybe. If you're still praying about the same thing and you've been praying it for months and your prayer hasn't changed, you're in trouble. <laughs> thank you, brother. I don't know if they agree with me, but I <laughs> thank you. It's true. If you're still praying about the same problem and you're more desperate now than you were when you started out, you're in trouble. Because there comes a point that assurance needs to get a hold of your life. That what I'm praying about, God, I know you've heard me, so therefore I'm going to leave it in your hands. So instead, God, I'm going to praise you now for what I know is on the way. My prayer has turned into praise. Because I know I've done all I can do and I can't do no more but I'm going to stand here and watch what God is going to do. God's working this out, church. God is working this out. I can leave it in his hands because I know nothing ever comes out of his hands. He holds on to everything. <laughs> now sometimes doing all you can do puts you in a place of desperation. See, you may feel like tonight you've reached your limit, but God is not limited. No. When you stand, when you yield yourself to God's plan and God's power. The problem with some of us is we don't know how to yield ourselves to God, and there's some of us we just don't want to yield ourselves. I, I learned a long time ago, I have nothing to prove to God. How can I, being weak and frail and being humanity, prove anything to God? There's nothing to prove. So God does not say to me, all right, Palmer, here's this problem. You work it out and you deal with it because I want to see how you work. Prove to me you can handle this. I don't have to prove anything because he's not expecting me to prove anything. He's expecting me to lay it in his hands and stand back and give him glory as he begins to take care of this thing. I'm yielding myself to God. I don't have to hold on to this thing and work it out. I yield myself to God and I yield myself to his plan and to his power. That's why Simon Peter wrote and said, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil or stand against the devil and he will flee from you. Now, a lot of times when you hear people quote that, they say, resist the devil, and he shall flee. Well, how many times have we resisted the devil and he still stood there laughing at you? Because we missed the first part of the scripture. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. There is power in submission, church. You understand, when I walk into this church, I yield myself and submit myself to this pastor. If he jerks my coat and says quit, I quit. Care how long I've been preaching. If he tells me where the problem is, I don't want you to talk about that, I shut up and I don't talk about it. Why? Because I submit myself to his authority. And because I learn how to submit myself to his authority, God gives me power and authority to do what he called me here to do. That's why if some of you tonight will learn how to submit yourself to the place where God has you, he can exalt you to the place of your expectation. Submit yourself to the vision of this church. Submit yourself to the vision of this pastor and to the ministry of this pastor. And you watch what God will do in your life. You'll find yourself standing when everybody around you says, how 
you're doing it. You've got to stand against the devil tonight and deny him access to the place that God has put you in. Because there's power in submitting yourself to God. Defy the devil and let him know this is where God has planted me. And you're not going to move me. God put me here and I'm going to stay right here. Resist the devil. Submit. Resist. And he'll flee from you. Woo! My Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Sometimes you got to just put stuff in order. Paul said, when I get there, I'll put things in order. Sometimes you guys got to put stuff in your life in order. You just got to put some things in order. The enemy loves confusion. That's why you got to put things in order. There's an order to everything. The Bible talks about powers being submitted to higher powers. There's a, there's a hierarchy in the heavens. God rules and reigns over all the earth, all over, all, over, all over all the universe, but there are hierarchy. Everything is decently done and everything is in order. God never does anything with loose ends. Everything is always done decently and in order. Everything about your life, if you were to look, if God were to give you a glimpse into the plan of your life, you would not see chaos anywhere written in the plan of your life. You wouldn't see it. You would see things in your life in order. You would see things in your life and in my life, things that right now are just scattered everywhere. You'd see them all coming back into place. And it's, it's troubling. And I'm, I'm about to close. It's troubling when you go through life like this. And it's hard for you to stand. When you go through life because you've got so many loose ends. Everything's, this is, this is out, of, out of control. This over here is not working out. This over here is like this. This over here. And it gets us running from one place to another. And it gets us off the track of what God has called us to be on. And as a church, you have to function in decent, decently and in order. Because if it doesn't, you have a church in chaos. A church in chaos is not good for any of us. But a church that is solid. See, what you believe in is important. What you listen to, what you talk about, what you hear is important. It saddens me. I was sitting across the table a few, about a week ago across from a pastor and his son was sitting across from us and he's the youth pastor of the church and this secular song comes on the radio in the restaurant where we're eating and this young man who's supposed to be the youth pastor of the church is over there singing the song. And the pastor had just told me the night before, he said, I'm making my son the new youth pastor and I'm sitting across the table and I'm saying to him, not out loud, but in my mind. Don't do it. Don't do it. He needs to pray through before he thinks of anything about doing that. We've got a young people, our young people are listening to this kind of stuff that's going on in the world and all these trends and all this stuff is designed for one thing, to knock you off of what you believe in. Because the mentality of the world is just believe just whatever we tell you to believe. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to have any politician, I don't care what party they're from, telling me what I'm supposed to believe in. Just because they believe it one way doesn't mean I have to believe it that way either. No. This is my guideline. This is what I live by, and this is what I believe in, and this is what I stand on tonight. And because of it tonight, then listen to what the Lord told Moses. He said, every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Man, that scripture right there makes me want to walk up and down the streets of Wharton and say, God, you give it to this church. Come on. And he said, there shall not be any man be able to stand against you. He said, every place you put down your foot, I'm going to give it to you, Moses. And nobody will be able to stand before you. Nobody can resist you. 
The same promise was given to Joshua. Joshua 1 5. He said, Joshua, there shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I also be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And I tell you, in 2015, the promise still remains for you and me. Jesus said, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. And Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? So you know what? Why don't you stand your ground? If you've done everything you can do, stand your ground and know it. If God is for you, who can be against you? No running, no hiding, no quitting, no giving up. If I've done all I can do, I will stand. Let's stand together and praise him. I said I will stand. God is with me. Who can be against me? I tell you, the enemy is full of tricks, but God is the answer. Paul said we battle against the wiles of the devil. Tricks. Deception. Hmm. But God has always had the answer. And God will always provide us with the strength and the power we need to stand our ground. If you're tired of being pushed around, say, God, give me strength to stand. And Paul said, stand therefore, having on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, loins girt about with truth, feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. And also what? Praying in the Spirit. Every time a warrior would go out to battle, they wouldn't just stand there with their armor on, they hollered. They would shout for the battle. Paul said, when you've done all you can do, he said, stand with the armor of God on you. And God is able to make you stand. See, sometimes we don't always advance. Sometimes it takes a while to stand before we can advance. But if we stand tonight, God will give us the victory. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Paul said, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, and quit you like men, and be strong. There's help tonight, church, for our weariness, for our stumbling. There's help tonight for our panic. There's help tonight for our worry. David said, you will enlarge my steps under me. And at one point he said, you enlarge my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. God will make you stand tonight, church. How many know he'll make you stand tonight? Hallelujah. Is anybody going to take a stand in this church tonight? Anybody got a made up mind here tonight? Anybody going to hold on to the end, hold out to the end? Anybody going to do something for God this year? Come on, you're going to stand in the place where God has put you. And you're going to defy the devil and you're going to resist the devil. And you're going to see the devil flee from you tonight. Oh, because he can't stand it when you take a stand for something. As the saying goes, if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. So tonight I'm standing on the word. And I'm holding on to the promise of God tonight. Anybody got a promise from God you're holding on to? Come on, anybody in this house got a promise from God that you're holding on to tonight? I've got a promise from him of victory for my family. I'm standing on it tonight. I'm standing up for my family. I'm standing up for what I believe in. I'm standing up for what I know is true. I'm standing up for my brothers and for my sisters tonight because they need intercessors in the house of God tonight. Let's worship him just a moment, if you would, tonight. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the power of your word and the power of your spirit tonight. Lord, confirm your word with signs following tonight, God. Lord, I pray that somebody in here tonight, God, will get their mind made up right now. That, Lord, no matter who walks away, who leaves them, what comes against them tonight, God, they will stand their ground. And they will hold on to the promise that you gave them tonight, God. And because of it, Lord, they'll see the victory come. They may be beat and feel the effects of the enemy hitting them, but, God, they've got armor on tonight. And they may be beat, but they will not be destroyed. Because they're standing in the power of grace. They're standing in the power 
of the promise of God tonight. Now, thank you right now, God. I praise you. Can we praise him right now for the promises of his word? Oh, there's a promise for your healing tonight. Are you going to stand on it? There's a promise for your victory. Are you going to stand on it tonight? Well, there's a promise for your joy. Stand on it tonight and get ready for the joy to come. I've got a promise of peace. I'm going to stand on it till my peace comes. Come on, has anybody got a promise for your family to be saved tonight? Stand on it till your family gets saved. Stand on it. Hallelujah. We've got a promise in the last day, saith God. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I'm standing on a promise tonight. I'm standing on a promise from God tonight. Hallelujah. Raise your hand if you've got a promise from God in this house. Tell them that I'm standing on it tonight. And you're not going to move me off of it. I'm standing on the promise tonight. And I'm not going to give up on it. I'm standing on a promise from God tonight. Come on. In the mighty name of Jesus, I praise you tonight. Hallelujah. Let's come and stand around the front together if you would right now. Let's come.